Thank you. Hello. Welcome to the candidate forum for Los Angeles County Superior Court Office Number 135, presented by the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles County. I am Margo Rieg, the co-president of the LA County League of Women Voters, which is composed of the 10 local leagues throughout the County of Los Angeles. Our organization is a nonpartisan grassroots organization that works to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the county, state, and national levels. We put on candidates forums as part of our voter service activity so that voters can hear from the candidates who are vying to represent them and Yet have the opportunity to learn more about these people. The Los Angeles Superior Court judges are elected locally or appointed by the governor to six year terms. In order to become a judge, a lawyer must have been a member of the LA County or the California State Bar Association for at least 10 years and must have been in practice as a lawyer for at least 10 years. Leading up to the March primary, the League of Women Voters of LA County is hosting candidate forums for as many of the judicial seats as we can uh, make arrangements for. And we hope that you take the advantage, uh, the opportunity to watch these on the League's YouTube channel, which is at LWVLAC. Our moderator for the forum this evening is Dolores Gonzalez Hayes, who is a member of the Whittier League of Women Voters. Dolores has held positions as policy advisor to a member of Congress, executive director and policy director for a nonprofit uh, sector, national community development manager of a national bank, and housing director in local government. Our candidates this evening have agreed to the league's rules which require that they speak only about themselves and that they adhere to our time limits. We thank all of our candidates this evening, Stephen Lee Mack, Muhammad Ali Fakhreddin, and Georgia Huerta for agreeing to participate. We know that they have very, very busy schedules and we appreciate their uh, making time to do this candidate forum. Dolores. Thank you, Marco, and welcome candidates to today's forum. We will begin with your opening statements by each candidate in alphabetical order. We will begin with Mr. Muhammad Ali Fahreddin, who's an attorney. Mr. Fahreddin. Yes. Thank you, and <clears throat> giving me the opportunity to be here today and putting on this judicial forum. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ali Fakhreddin, and I'm running for judicial seat number 135. I have been practicing as a civil litigation attorney and an appellate attorney for a little over 15 years. My area of practice has been general business disputes, probate disputes, family law disputes, uh, construction de uh, defect disputes, and so forth. I have numerous appellate decisions that have been published uh, several of them have been landmark decisions uh, regarding landmark cases and uh, have been published in the California practice guides that attorneys use in their daily practice. I am a father of five kids, married to my wife for over 25 years, and we have been foster parents for almost 20 years and have fostered mm -hmm. almost uh, 30 to 40 children in that time period. We have been in the uh, uh, Foster Auxiliary uh, Group, which is a group that supports foster youth. And I am a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I have been in business as well. I've had my own uh, clothing distribution company, which um, 
I ran for about 30 years. And um, thank you so much. And thank you for having me here today. Next is Huerta. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, uh, Women uh, Voters League, for uh, having this forum and allowing me to participate. I have been a deputy district attorney for over 30 years for the Los Angeles District Attorney's mm -hmm. Office. And during that time, I have served the people of the County of Los Angeles uh, as a deputy district attorney. My trial experience, I will, first of all, I am a criminal lawyer. However, uh, I have done 80 trials to verdict, those trials ranging anywhere from petty thefts to special circumstance murders. I've been a calendar deputy and filing deputy. I've handled thousands of cases by reading them, reviewing them, evaluating them, determining whether or not they should be filed and to disposition. I will tell you in the district attorney's office, I've served in four different special units. I've served in an employee relations unit. I've served in the workers' comp unit. I've served in juvenile and alternative sentencing court. All those different areas required me to learn different areas of the law so I could effectively do my job to serve the people here in Los Angeles County, and I did that. I would also let you know that I am strongly connected to the community. Uh, I have worked with Project LEAD, which is an organization reaching out to fifth graders to teach them about uh, how to make good decisions. I've done that for several years. I am very active in my church as a board of trustee and as a usher board president and as a COVID-19 uh, coordinator. And I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Just want to remind um, all of our candidates uh, that the minimum is one minute for your responses or your statements. Next, we have Mr. Yeah. Mack. Good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is Stephen Mack. I have a lifetime commitment to service and defending democracy. I am a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army Reserve. I've served in the military for over 20 years. I've also been a deputy district attorney for the last 10 years. I've been practicing law for uh, over 15 years now. I've, I'm from LA. My parents were refugees of uh, the Vietnam War, and they made their first home in South Central LA, where I was born and raised. Uh, we moved around. I went to uh, school in LA Unified and Montebello Unified School Districts. I was I attended Berkeley on an ROTC scholarship and was commissioned as a, a military officer. Uh, in 2012, I deployed to Afghanistan, where I served as a legal advisor for a unit that covered the entire theater of operations. I came back to LA to serve my community where I became a prosecutor. I'm currently in the gang unit in the LA County District Attorney's Office. I handle the most complex of murder cases that happen in LA. Uh, I hope my commitment to service has shown through and I look forward to answering your questions tonight. Thank you everyone for your opening statement. It allowed us to get to know more about your candidacy. Now we come to the question and answer part of the forum. The questions will be answered by each candidate and for the timing issues, it's one minute. And the first question goes to Ms. Georgia Huerta. Overall, do you feel the criminal justice system works fairly and effectively in Los Angeles County? If not, why not? Do you think Los Angeles County courts do a good job of handling civil cases? And if not, why not? Ms. Huerta. I believe as it relates to criminal uh, cases, felonies and misdemeanors, I believe the county does an overall fairly and effective job. And the reason why I say that is that when an individual is brought into court, they have representation, they have an attorney. They have to appear within 48 hours before a magistrate. So it's very structured. Once they appear before a magistrate within a period of time, their preliminary hearing is set. If they're held to answer, they are sent to a trial court. Within 30 days, a pretrial is set, and 60 days, a trial date is set. So the procedure and the guidelines are there for efficiency and to get the case processed. However, in the civil cases, I think there can be more room for improvement. It's just the opposite. Individuals who go into civil court, nine times out of 10, are not represented by attorneys. So they are not familiar with the process, and they don't have the help to get them through the process. As a result, the system flows much slowly. 
I believe that the judge in the civil court is really the factor that help push these civil cases through because there's such a huge backlog of them. And that backlog is there because there are not enough judges or courtrooms to actually hear these cases. So okay, thank, you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. You're welcome. All right. The following is Stephen Mack. Yes, I believe I believe our system of justice uh, overall uh, works well because it is a model for the world. Uh, mm -hmm. how, we, how we administer justice is something that our, the rest of the world should follow, but that doesn't mean that we can't use some improvements. In the criminal court system, uh, we need better facilities, we need better resources, we need better data management to help the good people that work in our court system, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, uh, the judges, the staff, the jurors who enter our courtroom to make important decisions. And I believe that's also true for the civil court system. Uh, our economy and our community is the strongest in the world. Uh, we are the eighth largest uh, economy in terms of California in the world. Uh, we should also give the appropriate resources to show how our commerce and civil disputes are resolved so that they are they do not lag in court for many years. These disputes impact people just as much as criminal disputes, and we should prioritize resolving disputes. Thank you. Mr. Mohammed Fakhreddin. Yes, thank you. Uh, being a civil litigation attorney, uh, <clears throat> my experience in civil litigation and, and the civil litigation courthouses is such that I believe some portions of the court system is functioning functioning well. Um, they have made significant efforts to try and help self-represented parties because in civil litigation, you're not entitled to an attorney as you are in criminal uh, cases. However, in certain forums such as in family law, um, there's a lot to be uh, helped, especially in cases in family law where they mean a lot to people um, personally, family-wise. Um, they are very understaffed. They need to appoint more judges to that particular area of the law. Uh, they need to, um, as an example, on a regular candle, uh, case calendar in family law, you have 50 to 60 cases. And in a three hour, three, three and a half hour period, each case gets maybe one to two minutes before the court has to go on to another case. And uh, even if they set it for a long cause hearing, uh, it's generally continued again and again and again. So they really need to add additional funding and appoint more judicial officers to the civil forum, especially in, in areas such as family law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. To what extent have you practiced criminal law, family law, complex civil litigation, and what types of clients have you represented? Mr. Mo uh, Mohammed Fakhreddin. Yes, I've handled, as I mentioned, family law cases, probate cases, uh, complex litigation cases. Uh, my typical clients are going to be the, the general uh, individual plaintiff, individual defendant, uh, small businesses. Um, and in that area, uh, I've handled everything, child custody, um, I've handled um, you know, property disputes, uh, asset disputes, custody disputes, um, um, support disputes. And I, I find that the, the litigants that are the ones that are not well off, the ones that are of limited financial needs are the ones that really get left behind, especially in the complex areas of, of family law and probate. Uh, whereas in uh, the business disputes, they're generally more uh, well-funded and uh, uh, seasoned parties because they deal with it in, in, on a regular basis. And I, I feel like I spend most of my time an effort in helping the people that are in the family law and probate that this is a one-time occurrence for them. Thank you. Ms. Georgia Huerta. Uh, I am a deputy district attorney. So that means that I have practiced criminal law. Uh, 
and I represent and serve all the people in Los Angeles County. That means the people who live in the community, victims, and the accused as well. And it's my job to keep it community safe for everyone, and that's what I have done. As I've stated, I have had the experience of trying multiple different types of cases in the district attorney's office. And I think that's important because it exposes you to different areas of the law and different people, as opposed to just trying the same type of case over and over again. As I stated, I've been in four separate units. I practiced before the Civil Service Commission and the Employee Relations Commission. I had the opportunity to work for three years in the Alternative Sentencing Court, which is geared toward our most vulnerable, the homeless, mental health, um, uh, individuals of that nature. And the purpose of that court is treatment and rehabilitation and not punishment. So I have had three years in dealing with that type of situation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Mack. I am a deputy, deputy district attorney, so I have extensive experience in criminal law. In the past just five years, I've uh, taken 14 cases 14 murder cases to jury trial. Uh, I also have extensive experience in other areas of law. I uh, practice in the United States Army. I've uh, practiced in, uh, in government contracts and congressional appropriations, advising commanders and units about how to uh, wage war within the laws that Congress gives us. But my most proudest uh, uh, clients are representing soldiers. I was a defense attorney for soldiers who returned from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq with mental health issues, drug issues, and I defended them when the U.S. Army accused soldiers of misconduct. I also uh, held a position called legal assistance. I was a supervisor where I oversaw um, helping soldiers resolve civil disputes like torts, car crashes, landlord-tenant issues, and also family law issues where they were in divorces and child custody battles. I have extensive experience and I hope to apply that experience as a judge. Thank you. Next question. If you observed a party in your courtroom being poorly represented by an unprepared or ineffective lawyer, how would you handle the situation? Mr. Stephen Mack. A judge has a number of ways to handle a situation where um, the 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 court observes uh, uh, improper representation. In criminal court, there's a if a client is indigent, there's a process called a Marsden hearing where the court asks the client, uh, asks the defendant, uh, the accused, whether they feel their uh, representation is a uh, adequate. Uh, in civil court, uh, the, the 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 clients have more ability to um, to hire and fire their attorneys, um, but also the Superior Court uh, website and system has self-help resources. Those resources should be expanded. Uh, those resources, resources are important for the public to understand the judicial process and how the court system works to resolve disputes. And I believe as a judge, I will uh, uh, first help litigants uh, ensure that they are properly represented and also that uh, people that come into my court have the appropriate means and avenues to look for more information. Thank you. Mr. Mohammed Fakhreddin. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, unlike, so unlike criminal cases in the civil forum, uh, parties are not entitled to an attorney and therefore they don't have the right to effective representation as they do in criminal law. And as a judicial officer in a, in a civil matter, your, your options are, are more severely limited because judicial officers are bound by certain judicial canons in which you're not allowed to give judicial advice to a party in front of you. However, if I see that a party is not being represented properly, there are certain things that can be said within the uh, judicial lines of canon, uh, expressing doubt about the, the theories that an attorney is making, uh, the strength of those arguments and uh, other potential arguments that may be out there without ex expressly stating them. Uh, again, because of the limitations and the judicial canons, uh, the judicial officers 
alternatives or remedies are severely limited, unlike in criminal cases. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Georgia. Yes, I've been an attorney for over 30 years, spending the majority of that time in a courtroom. And I will tell you, there's a Sixth Amendment right to counsel. In a courtroom, in a criminal case, an individual is represented by an attorney. And as a judge looking on, I may know that that attorney is not being effective, may not be doing a good job, but his client may think he's walking on water. His client may think that's the best attorney there. A judge has to be very, very careful when they want to step in between a client and I'm an attorney and their client. So you have to be very careful about that. It's not something that you just do. If it's just blatant and obvious, such as if the attorney comes into court intoxicated or sleeping at the counsel table, then you can interject. But the last thing that I would want to happen as a judge is for me to be accused of interfering with that attorney client privilege. So uh, that's a Sixth Amendment right and it is well protected. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. What have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency? What other methods would you suggest improving procedures and reduce delays? Ms. Georgia Huerta. Well, I think one thing that uh, we can do to help improve procedures in the criminal court, the procedures are pretty well laid out, the process, I talked about that. In civil court, the process is not laid out like that. It's not structured like that. And that's why, and the deadlines and the due dates that things must be done are not present there in civil cases. So that's why a matter can take longer in a civil case to actually come to resolution than in a criminal case. But I think the most important thing that we can do, at least as a judge, to improve the procedure and to uh, reduce delays is be an active participant in keeping the court moving to make sure deadline dates are met, to make sure the discovery is complied with in a timely manner, to make sure parties are communicating, to keep the case going and not continuing it and not being prepared. Thank you. Mr. Mohammed Fakhridi. Yes, uh, in the civil forum, I think there's two things that the court has instituted recently that has helped. And there's one additional thing that I think needs to be um, added as well. The one thing I think they need to add, and I've mentioned this previously, is they need to hire more judicial offers in the family law forum. There really is just, there's delay after delay because the judicial officers do not have time to hear your case. As I mentioned, you know, you have parties going in there, they spend four or five hours waiting for their case to get called. They go up for one to two minutes and then the court says you have to come back on another day. It's a waste of time and money for parties that generally don't have the funds to deal with that. The thing I think they have done well in the other forums in the civil forums is the meet and, meet and confer requirements before filing motions or discovery motions. Uh, those have helped resolve a lot of issues and minimize the amount of time and resource on the judicial officers but they need to institute it in more uh, circumstances and the judicial officers need to enforce it. The last thing is that they added was the informal discovery conference, which helped resolve discovery disputes informally rather than a formal motion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Mack. Yes, I, I believe improvements in procedure can be gained through uh, encouraging compatible technology in the criminal court system, the biggest part of delays in complex cases and in small cases is the, is the exchange of discovery. Um, there are many different agencies and, and attorneys and, and, and uh, groups are providing discovery in different in very different formats. Uh, we as justice partners uh, should work together to develop a way to exchange information efficiently. And in the civil courts, that is also a big uh, source of delay and uh, inefficiencies is the exchange of information. As a bar, uh, mm -hmm. we should formulate methods for us as, as a representatives of clients to exchange information so that we have the baseline facts and universe in which 
we are litigating issues. Thank you. Last question. If you became aware of unethical conduct on the part of a trial advocate in a case in which you were presiding, how would you handle it? Do you believe judges should be required to report attorney misconduct? Mr. Mohammed Fakhreddin? Yes. <clears throat> I, I believe depending on the conduct, there's judicial canons that outline um, the, the methods and the things that judicial officers can do. However, what I would do is I would start off with a um, informal conference in chambers and with both attorneys and discuss the conduct. If it happens again, I would note on the record the conduct and reprimand the attorney on the record. If it happens again, and if allowed by judicial canons, I would report them to the California State Bar for proper, for proper action. Uh, other than that, it would really depend on the on the misconduct. But regardless, I believe those are the most appropriate ways of handling those situations. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. George. Is it Georgia? Yes, you. Uh, I agree. It depends on what the conduct is. Uh, for example, if an attorney misrepresents and says, uh, Your Honor, I need a continuance because I need, I'm need i in trial in another court, and you find out that they're not in trial, that's uh, unethical because they misrepresented to the court. So in a case like that, I would just admonish them, counsel, you know, be more candid with the court. But if it's really something serious, like act an act of more turpitude, then I would do something different. First of all, I would go look at the rules of professional conduct that's published by the California Bar Association to see whether or not that's anything that's been violated. No, Second, I would talk to a colleague. Third, I would do some research about that colleague. And if in fact it is a violation, then yes, I would report them because that is what I was be required to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Mack. Yes. Um Misconduct and enforcing misconduct starts with making a clear and detailed record. Uh, that should be a habit for every judicial officer to put everything on the record and to ensure that the record reflects what's going on in court. Uh, that's important because when circumstances of misconduct happens, it's important to first determine uh, whether there was misconduct in the first place. It's not it's it's not uh, good for judicial officers to jump to conclusions when we are in an adversarial system. But when there is misconduct and we find it and we uh, it's on the record. Uh, then it is important for a judge to ensure that their form, their courtroom, does not allow uh, misconduct that uh, deceives, uh, is unethical, or uh, misstates facts, or misrepresents uh, what is going on. And there is there are duties under the, our canons and the state bar to report that conduct. And because we are a profession, it is important that we self-regulate each other so that we do the important job of bringing justice for our community. Thank you. Now we come to the concluding statements by each candidate, and each of you have one minute. Concluding statements will be in reverse order from the opening statements. So the first statement will be given to us by Mr. Stephen Mack. Thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration. Um, my experience in the legal format in trials and advisory uh, roles in representing clients and representing the people of California has uh, given me the skills to oversee a courtroom. But most importantly, what is important is perspective. Uh, the perspective from my military service, my service daily in a community that is affected by violence, my experience in a community that, show, that I have known to show the best of our country. Um, that perspective is important because it gives us as uh, potential judicial officers uh, a view about the truth of this world. And that truth is important to bring into the courtroom so that justice can be had for our community. Thank you. Ms. Georgia Huerta. Yes, I believe 
And I know I do uh, possess the necessary relevant experience to be a Superior Court judge. I have spent my entire career working in the place where I want to be a judge in, and that's in the Superior Court judge, as a Superior Court judge. I've seen judges that I would model myself out uh, after based on their conduct and what they do. And I also have seen judges that I would not. I believe that the community deserves a bench that is representative and that is diverse of the people that are sitting there. But not only that, that that person brings different life experiences to the bench. I believe that enriches the bench and make the bench more accessible and trusted by the community. So I believe that I possess the necessary skills, criteria to be an effective judge here in Los Angeles County. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mohammed Fakhreddin. Thank you for having me here today. And I'm running to be a judge because I love the law. It's as simple as that. I love it. That's why I do appeals as an appellate attorney. I look at <clears throat> what judges review facts, review the law, review the evidence before them. And I review whether they made the right decisions, handled their court properly, or if they made errors, and if they made errors, to reverse those. And in doing so, I believe I've garnered a lot of experience in what judicial officers can do right and what judicial officers do wrong. I have no personal bias or agenda in becoming a judge other than I love the law. And because of that, if you vote for me, all you're going to get is a judge that doesn't see color, doesn't see race, is impartial, and will give you a fair and equal opportunity as any other party in my judicial courtroom. So I'm asking for your vote, and hopefully you will vote for me, uh, judicial seat number 135. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Yeah. And okay. Thank you all for participating in this candidate forum. I think that our viewers will uh, understand a little bit better where each one of you is coming from and why, uh, what motivates you and what qualities you have to serve as a judge. These forms will be posted on YouTube and the URL is at LWVLAC. We will also link it to our vote 411 page so that people who look up your uh, information on vote 411 will have the opportunity to go watch the video. Uh, vote 411 is a new voter information and education website that the League of Women Voters of California has adopted this year. It <clears throat> has a voter lookup. If you place put your address in, you will receive a list of all the races that will show up on your ballot. And within each race, you can go to each race and see who the candidates are. And you can choose to compare answers among the candidates that have submitted information. So please take the opportunity to research your ballot by going to vote411.org. So I again want to thank each of you. I want to thank our moderator, Dolores Gonzalez-Hayes, and I want to encourage everyone to vote. Your ballot will be here in a week, and please cast your ballot anytime between uh, February 5th and March 5th so that your opinion is heard. Thank you very much. <laughs>